Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Dear sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to another lesson of the 70 major sins and how to avoid them based on Kitab al-Kaba'ir by Imam al-Nawawi. Today we're going to do, we're going to talk about a major sin that uh, people find hard to talk about this one, you know. Like I even um, had some discuss discussions with Shuyur and when I wanted to prepare for this class and even they said that it's almost become like a topic that you shy away from as well, especially in, in Western countries. So inshallah, we're not going to shy away from it because when it comes to matters of the deen, you know, we don't have a right to, to censor the deen, right? Uh, if you think about it, I remember once I was giving a talk to sisters about the hijab and there were some women in the audience who, who did not wear hijab, who did not observe hijab, right, in any way. And obviously there were some tough things that I was saying, you know, for, from their perspective, I thought that they might get offended, you know, because I was talking about the obligation, etc. And I remember afterwards, uh, one of my dear sisters, Sister Rahma Abdul Latif, I don't know if you know her, she's a wonderful sister here in London, um, who is a Talibat al Elm and really like, I think she's a counselor as well. She's really um, a wise sister. She took me aside afterwards and she said, you know, Fatima, when you're, when you're giving a talk and you're, you're telling people about a command of Allah, then never apologize, <laughs> you know? She said, never apologize. And the reason why she said it is because I remember when I was giving the talk, I said, look, I, I don't want to offend anyone. You know, I was like being like a bit apologetic, I guess she felt. And so she said, don't, don't be embarrassed and don't ever apologize because you're telling them what their creator asked of them. You're giving them a gift at the end of the day, right? So with that spirit, inshallah, <laughs> we shall proceed. So one of the major sins, major sin number 47, is nushuzul mar'ati ala zawjiha, a wife's disobedience towards her, her, her husband, a wife's disobedience towards her husband. Now, you know, sometimes you, you can ask yourself, like, in our culture, it's not normal to say obedience, right? Like people don't, apparently even the, 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 the Christian church has removed, you know, when, when they have a marriage, uh, marriage vows, um, they used to be to, to, ha to, to have and to hold to something and to obey, right? <laughs> right, so what, one of the vows that the wife would give when she was getting married, you know, that the, altar she would say uh, that she agrees to obey her husband and I think it was uh, Prince William and sorry I don't know why I keep referring to the royal family <laughs> it's, it's very British of me to do that uh, but yeah it's just I just happen to know royal family trivia right um, but also because if you think about it the 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 elite family in any society they set the tone for the rest of the society, right? So I remember when Prince William was getting married, um, they removed the words to obey from the vows that uh, his wife, Kate Middleton, was going to say in the church. So you can see that's what's happened in our society now, that even saying that you're willing to obey your husband has become like, a weird thing, right? Well, why should it be? Like when we say obedience to parents, people don't flinch, right? Like one of the major sins is disobedience to parents, right? Or, or treating them, not treating them well, but it's also disobedience to parents. That's a major sin. And that's a major sin even when you're an adult, right? 
it's even a major sin if you're an adult if your parents ask you to do something and it's not haram and you're able to do it then generally speaking you're supposed to do it um not in everything okay not in every area but generally we understand obedience to parents when it comes to the husband uh, people have a problem with it but they only have a problem with it because they don't understand the balance that islam seeks to create in society with the hierarchy within the family okay um and they don't understand the immense responsibility that islam places upon the shoulders of men or on the shoulders of husbands right wherever a person seems to have um, a certain privilege you will see that they also have a higher degree of responsibility in islam and that's the case with the husband as well whereas in wider society husband and wife are being seen as partners now okay uh both equally are supposed to be responsible for financial provision um you know splitting the bill and all that right um at the end of the day it's unrealistic because there's no equality at all how is it equality if husband and wife are both responsible for financial provision and yet the wife bears the majority of the burden of childbirth pregnancy childbirth and child rearing and has to bear the responsibility for financial provision like how is that equal there's no, it's, it's the idea that that's equal is a fallacy it's it's a fallacy so we need to not buy into this uh, narrative Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran ar-rijalu qawamuna 'ala an-nisa bima faddala Allah ba'dhum 'ala ba'd wa bima anfaqu min amwalihim fas-salihat fas-salihat qanitat lil ghaybi bima hafidha Allah men are in charge of women men are the protectors and maintainers of women sometimes people translate it as they are qawam over the women because men have been provisioned by Allah over women bima faddala Allah ba'dhum ala ba'd because of what the qualities Allah has given one over the other wa bima anfaqu min amwalihim and because they are tasked with supporting them financially and then Allah says so the righteous women the pious women are devoutly obedient and they guard in their husband's absence what Allah would have them guard and of course this aya means that men Allah has made men in charge of women in the family the husband is the ceo right the husband is the director if you like could say the husband is the director and the wife is the ceo actually <laughs> that's one way of looking at it right but the the person who the buck stops with is the husband he makes the final decisions uh that's not to say that a husband should never consult his wife of course a husband should consult his wife uh any wise husband would do that anyway right unless he wants you know constant constant headache right he would always consult his wife anyway but he doesn't have to and at the end of the day he's the amir he is the person in charge and <clears throat> when you're when you are an amir you might consult with people you might do shura but you make the final decisions right so the husband is the head of the house um and that's because allah has given men certain characteristics just as he's given women certain characteristics and so men are suited to that role allah created men to be suited to that role and it keeps the balance in the family 
and also because Allah has given them the responsibility for providing for the family. So there's a huge responsibility and burden on them. And therefore, because Allah has given them so much responsibility and a higher degree of responsibility, Allah has also placed, given them certain rights and asked us, asked the wives to be obedient to their husbands and guard in their husband's absence what Allah would have them guard. Yani, when the husband is away, you uh, as a wife are protecting and taking care of his wealth, his children, and of course yourself in terms of the way you dress, who you allow into your home, um, and just conducting affairs the way your husband would want them to be conducted, right? So you respect your husband's wishes, even when he's not there, even when he's not there. So look, let's talk about some of the husband's responsibilities because the reason why we have to mention this is because I think a lot of the time we've forgotten this. And that's why sisters find it hard to accept that there's such thing as obedience, you know? Uh, when you see all of the responsibility of the husband, you realize, okay, no, this is fair. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. Some of the husband's responsibilities are to provide the mahr to his wife, okay, the dawah, which is something that when you're getting married, you, you can ask for a, a certain amount as a gift, okay, um, and he must give that, okay. Uh, you know, if he agrees and he's made the marriage contract with you, whatever has been put into that contract should be, should be honoured. To provide food, shelter, clothing for his wife's needs, according to what is the norm, right? According to what is the norm or what he is able to provide. So according to what is the norm could be like somebody of your background what's normal for somebody of your background to be provided with right so like okay if you're from a background where it was normal for you to have servants okay as an example maybe you're like you know upper class family and you had servants all your life and that's what you expect and that's what your husband has the ability to provide, then the norm for you is to have servants in your house, right? But if it's not that, for example, then it's not. So whatever a woman of your background or a woman from your, uh, of your social status, whatever the norm is, that's what is expected for the husband to provide and to provide for all the needs of the children, of course, his children, not to break the terms of your marriage contract, whether it's implicit terms or implicit terms, meaning things that are you know, any part of the marriage contract by default, for example, like we said, the provision, and then also uh, to be able to have sexual intercourse, right? Um, so those are the implicit terms and also the right to have children, for example, you know, like if a wife wants to have children, a husband shouldn't be stopping them from having children. Um, or any extra terms that were agreed when contracting the marriage. So maybe when you were putting together the marriage contract, there was some kind of stipulations that were put in there, for example, that the husband would stay in a particular country, that you would stay in a particular country together, etc. You know, any kinds of stipulations that were agreed in the marriage contract, they should be honored. And to treat co-wives equally in terms of division of time and finances, right? Unless a co-wife agrees that she doesn't want as much time, fine, right? But in terms of the norm, uh, each wife should be given an equal division of time and equality when it comes to gifts and anything kind of financial, right? 
and also to teach his family the obligatory aspects of the deen or provide the means to do so. So one of the rights of the child, for example, is that they, that the father teaches them Quran, right? So whatever uh, provision there can be for that is upon the father. Some of the wife's responsibilities are obedience. If the husband asks his wife to do something, something that is not disobedience to Allah, then the wife should do her best to fulfill that request. <laughs> also to make herself available to him physically, sexually, to not allow anyone to enter his house who he doesn't want. So she should only leave the house with his permission. And <clears throat> sometimes people misunderstand that and they think, does that mean like every time I'm going out, I have to like <clears throat> explicitly ask my husband? No, if there's, if there's a general agreement between you that, you know, you go out for all your needs, so that's fine. But for example, you're having an argument and you want to walk out, right? Having an argument, you feel like storming out of the house. You can't just do that. If he says, do not, do not leave the house, you can't leave the house. That's basically a sin, right? Um, and to serve him as is considered the norm. So as in, you know, just general cooking and those types of things. Um, if it's the norm in your society for you to cook and or to do whatever household things, then it becomes part of your responsibilities as well, right? Some points to remember. So <laughs> this major sin is nushuz, which is, which can be translated as rebellion or refusing to acknowledge the authority of the husband, okay? Um, the husband is ultimately the head of the family. And that needs to be understood. And unfortunately, I think it seems that some people from the younger generation don't have not been taught that because maybe because scholars are afraid to sort of say it in explicit terms. Um, it's politically incorrect or whatever, right? It seems like a lot of the younger generation have missed the memo, you know? They did it, they did, they never really heard that. And so now when they get married, they have unrealistic expectations of the marriage. Um, and we end up with weak men, right? Weak need men. And we end up with women who who don't get it, who don't understand that actually that hierarchy, if you want to call it that, within the family is there for the benefit of the family. It's there for the benefit of each person involved. If the wife is unhappy with the requests or demands of her husband, then of course she can negotiate with him, right, in a decent way. Um, and if a situation arises where they just can't resolve it between themselves, of course, if you try to resolve things between ourselves, right? as a husband and wife, you don't need to take every problem outside the family. And in fact, sometimes that's very detrimental, especially for little arguments and things like that. Of course, you should try to sort them out between yourselves. But if you can't, then Islam encourages us to seek mediation. And mediation is where you either both go to a, a person of knowledge, right? or it doesn't have to even be a person of knowledge. It can be somebody from either side, right? So uh, who is considered an elder or some kind of a well-wisher, a wise person, right? From her side or from and from his side, um, that can be a way of mediating between them. Or arbitration. Arbitration is more formal in the sense that uh, the woman brings somebody from her side who it doesn't have to be their, her father, doesn't have to be someone like that. It can be a sheikh that she trusts or 
a family member who she feels will represent her well uh, and cares about her, etc. And then the, the 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 husband brings somebody who he feels that way about as well. And they agree that once they have sat down and explained their issues, whatever those two people decide becomes binding on the two. Do you see? Whatever they decide becomes binding on the two. So that's what arbitration is. And then to escalate that even further, like if arbitration doesn't work, then the escalation is basically, um, you know, in front of a qadi or a sheikh, right? The Sharia Council or whatever, right? But obviously we, we want it not to get to that stage. We hope that it can, things can be resolved either between the couple or uh, through mediation or arbitration, right? I just thought I'd explain the kind of framework, you know, um, that Islam gives to a couple in terms of solving disputes. Now, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu reported, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if a woman prays her five prayers, fasts her month of Ramadan, guards her chastity and obeys her husband, she will enter paradise from any gate she wishes. SubhanAllah. Now just reflect on that for a moment. If a woman prays her five, pray your five prayers on time, fast the month of Ramadan, Guard your chastity, meaning don't have any illegal uh, sexual relations. And obeys her husband, she will enter paradise from any gate she wishes. And this, this hadith has been classed as sahih. If you think about that, that's a gift. You know, that's a gift to women. It's a gift to women. Put it up on your fridge, you know, as a list as a checklist. Am I keeping up with these things? Um, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu also said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, if a man calls his wife to his bed, obviously it means for sexual intercourse or in some kind of sexual, you know, relations, and she refuses and does not come, and he spends the night angry with her, the angels will curse her until the morning. SubhanAllah. So you see this hadith immediately makes that a major sin, right? Because if the angels curse somebody, then that is a major sin, right? Um, and it shows you the immense kind of um, importance of realizing that as a wife, you, you're actually helping your husband to stay chaste, just as he is supposed to be helping you to stay chaste, right? Why do we get married? One of the reasons is to be able to have a loving marriage, a loving union, but also a sexual union, right? In a halal way in a way that is pleasing to God, pleasing to Allah, and to be able to have children. But we can't diminish the fact that an important part of it is to be able to have sexual relations and to express ourselves sexually, right? So here, this hadith really spells out for us that as a wife, if your husband is calling you, even if you're busy doing something, okay, um, you should respond, okay? And th this is why there's the hadith about, you know, not fasting, voluntary fasts, when your husband is present without asking his permission. Because when you're in a state of fasting, obviously you, you can't have sexual relations, and that kind of puts a, a barrier between you and your husband. But you can, obviously you have to do that in Ramadan, okay? That's a must. But outside of Ramadan, when it's a um, non-obligatory fast, 
then you should ask your husband or generally get his permission, you know, um, so that if he does want to have relations, he can do that and it's not pre prevented through you fasting. And remember, that's both ways, like even both ways in the sense, even though the, there's no hadith that explicitly says that, and there is a greater degree of responsibility uh, mentioned in this hadith. Generally speaking, you know, the Prophet ﷺ told men off who would fast all the time and stay up all night praying and neglected their wives. He, he criticized men who did that, right? Points to remember that it's both the husband and wife's moral duty to fulfill each other's sexual desires, right? It's not just the wife's duty, it's the husband's duty as well, right? The best of their ability. This doesn't mean, okay, that the husband can force his wife. Unfortunately, I, I've heard Duat sometimes talk about this concept of terrible to talk about it, but this idea of marital rape, right? Which is an unfortunate term, really. You know, it's a very Western term. I wouldn't personally use that term, but meaning a, a wife being forced, coerced to have sexual intercourse by a husband. And sometimes though, I talk about it in a very ambiguous way. I think it's very clear that the Sharia, there's no evidence in the Sharia that a husband has been allowed to force his wife, force his wife to have sexual intercourse against her will. However, now listen carefully, this is, it's, it's, a, it's a nuanced point that I'm making, right? However, it is the wife's moral duty to not refuse. Can you see the subtle distinction in that? That Islam does not permit a husband to force his wife. However, because a marriage, the marriage contract itself is a type of consent, okay? It's, a, it's like a general consent, isn't it? Between you both that you can uh, enjoy each other's company and intimacy, right? That's the whole point of a marriage contract, one of the main points, right? So because of that, it is the wife's moral duty to not refuse her husband, just as it's the husband's moral duty, okay, that if his wife has sexual needs, that he meets those sexual needs to the best of his ability and he doesn't neglect her, right? Um, but, okay, if she, if she refuses to have intercourse or to respond to his advances with a valid reason, then there's no sin upon her, right? If she's in pain, for example, or she's ill, or she's got some other reason, okay, only a, 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 a quite a brutish man, right, would force a woman who is ill, for example, or, or try to even, you know, coerce a woman who's ill to, to have relations with him, right? Um, so if she does have a valid reason, then she can say no, right? But the, the point is that it shouldn't be like an arbitrary thing, you know? And so morally, she would be sinful if without a valid reason, she refuses okay so i want you to bear those two things in mind that yes it's morally a sin she's sinful with allah yani, for refusing to have or refusing to have sexual relations with her husband without a valid excuse okay she's morally sinful but there's nothing in the deen that says that a man is allowed to force his wife to have sexual relations. If she has a valid reason, she can refuse and vice versa, right? It could be the other way around as well. Um, 
you know, some of the ulama talk actually about how, you know, even the husband, he shouldn't neglect his wife and there should be a minimum sort of sexual intimacy between them, right? He should try to maintain that because the wife also has sexual needs. Now, although I'm mentioning that, I don't want to diminish this major sin because this major sin is about the wife, right? This major sin is specific to the wife. And there are other major sins that you will have noticed in Kitab al-Kaba'ir that are, you could say, are specific to men, right? Because men hold those roles. So, for example, the judge, right, the unjust judge, et cetera, that's going to be a man. Um, so, you know, these are just basically the major sins that are mentioned, sins that are mentioned with some punishment or some uh, promise of curse or something like that attached to them, right? Abu Huraira anhu narrated that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, it's not permissible for a woman to fast when her husband is present, except with his permission. So this is the supererogatory fast, the nafil fast, not an obligatory fast. Or to allow anyone to enter his house without his permission. So if your husband explicitly says to you, I don't want such and such to, to be inside my house, okay? Uh, I don't want you to be alone with a man, for example, well, that shouldn't be happening anyway, but for example, right? Um, you should, you've got to listen to that. Um, Ibn Hajar explained this and he said, this hadith shows that the husband's right over the wife are more important than doing voluntary good deeds because fulfilling his right is obligatory and that which is obligatory takes precedence over voluntary acts. So look, as Muslim women, we should view this as obedience to Allah, right? If you're, if you're obeying Allah, it means you're getting rewarded anyway. You're getting rewarded for obeying your husband. So that is in, it, in and of itself a good deed. So inshallah, you're not losing out, in other words, right? By listening to your husband or obeying your husband. Before we move on, I'd like to see if anyone has any questions or comments about that. So we might be able to fit in another two actually, because I don't think we need to go into a lot of detail with these ones, but making images, making images on clothes, walls, things that are in the house, right? Uh, another translation actually says, making images on clothes, walls, stones, coins, and all things, whether it be in the wax, paste, iron, copper, wool, or anything else. I don't know where they got that detailed translation because the actual book doesn't say those details, but maybe it's part of the explanation. Anyway, the point is having statues, a person making statues, making sculptures that are of living things, that is a major sin, right? Um, making images, of things that are living also is a major sin. Having uh, images of living things on your walls, right? We should avoid that because the angels don't enter a house that has that. Ibn Abbas reported the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, every, every maker of graven images will be in the hellfire. Every image he made will be given a soul to punish him in hell. Ibn Abbas said, if you must do so, make images of trees, or whatever does not have a soul within it. And uh, like we could, we could link this sin to the fact that it was because human beings started making images of living things, right? And then sculptures of living things that they then went down the path of idolatry, right? You must know the story of how um, the first shirk started to happen, right? Because if you think about it, 
Adam alayhi salam, he must have been, sorry, not he must have been, he was, <laughs> he was a Muslim, right? He was a muwahid, he, he believed in Allah alone and his children as well and his children's children. But at some point down the line, something changed, right? And so the story goes that um, I believe it was uh, in one of the generations after Adam alayhi salam, many generations after Adam alayhi salam, when the pious people passed away, right? The elders, they passed away. The people, that generation that was left behind was very distraught, very distraught. And they thought, you know, we need to remember our elders in some way. They were so pious. And of course, Shaitan came to them and he encouraged them with that. And he said, why don't you why don't you create some likeness to them, right? And so they, they did that. They did that. They created something that would remind them of that dead person who had passed, that person who'd passed away, who was pious. And, you know, it led them to making statues. And then eventually bringing those statues into their, place of worship, right? Where they used to worship Allah alone. He said, let's just bring those statues into our place of worship. We'll keep them at the back. But when we see them, they'll remind us of our pious forefathers, our forebears, and it will make us better worshipers of Allah. And so they did that. You see how shaitan works by stealth. He never gets you to do a sin just like that, it's, you know, if you're a pious person, he doesn't just get you to, to do a sin like that, he'll, he'll just make certain things, he'll wear you away slowly. And then they would bring the images closer and closer to the front, right? With each generation, people forgot the purpose of those images, of those statues, and then eventually, those statues would end up at the front of the masjid or the place of worship. And then they began to worship those idols. Instead of calling Allah, they started calling on those idols, right? This is exactly how shirk came about. So we believe as Muslims that it wasn't that human beings were polytheists and then they became monotheists as you know some I don't know anthropologists seem to think it's actually the opposite that human beings were first monotheists and then they became polytheists uh, over time and you know anthropologists might say well there's no evidence for that like we have images and we have idols and then eventually um, we have evidence that people became monotheists. But the point is that you can't have evidence of monotheism, right, by definition, because monotheism means that you don't have statues, right? So that period of monotheism was there before. It was there before the polytheism. And the reason why you don't have so-called evidence of it or it seems that there isn't, is because there is no evidence for people worshipping one God, right? <laughs> because they don't have images. That's the whole point, right? So this is how shirk came about. And it could be that this is the reason why, you know, Islam is so strong against especially statues. And you can see, you know, people do worship statues. People even they idolize people right to an extreme um even some people when they put images of their sheikh in their house you know i've seen people put an image of their sheikh in the house and you think like why you know why are you doing that it's got that same connotation hasn't it the pious person i must have an image of the pious person in front of me to be able to i don't know somehow feel pious or become pious no, it, 
it's actually diverting your attention away from Allah towards somebody else. Don't do that. You don't need that. It's better to have an ayah of Quran or have, you know, things that will remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are not other human beings. It's better to have that. Um, now, photographs are not the same, okay? I don't believe photographs are the same as, um, as images that are made by hand or drawn by hand or shaped by hand, right? They're not the same because a photograph is like a mirror image of real life. Um, and nobody is actually shaping that and making that, right? So photographs don't come under that same category. But of course, there's difference of opinion regarding whether you can actually display photographs or not. Um, I would avoid it, just avoid it. There's no need to display photographs. You know, keep them in, a, in an album or something like that. Okay, let me see if there's any questions. Okay, yeah. So what about when children are told to draw images for schoolwork? So my, our policy in our family was that just as the Prophet وسلم, allowed children to have dolls, right? We know that children had dolls in, in his time, but they would have been quite crude probably, right? Uh, not like very perfectly formed, okay? Um, just as the Prophet وسلم, allowed children to have toys, um, while a child is young, uh, from my research and the opinion that I follow is that it's okay for them to do drawings, right? And it's okay for them to just allow them to explore and be free to a certain extent, right? But as they start getting older, you want to make it clear to them that what the rules are and for them to stop, you know? Again, books, for me, that would be similar to, similar to toys, you know? A children's book is basically like a toy, if you think about it. They treat it like a toy, you know, it's something for their entertainment, for their, I think it's, it's fine, you know, while they're children. Up to what age? I mean, look, definitely by the time they're adults, you want, to, you want them to stop. But even if there's an image in a book, okay, it doesn't mean you can't have the book, just cover the image, right? I mean, like, <clears throat> you know, as they get older, when they have teen books, the front cover might have uh, some painting on it or some uh, picture. You could just cover it, right, with something. It doesn't mean we're not going to have that book in the house. It just means cover it in some way, right? Change it or cover it. Look, like I said, generally speaking, when it comes to kids, the rules are a bit relaxed, okay? So uh, let the rules be relaxed. Uh, but if it's not necessary, well, I mean, there's no point putting things on walls, really. I mean, it's okay, especially if you can encourage them to draw scenery, trees, and those types of things to put on walls, flowers, objects, then fine. If it's people, just avoid it, you know? But if they really want to, I wouldn't really make a big fuss out of it because, again, it's like having toys, right, in the room. It's like that. So I hope that's helpful. Aisha Dilana reported that the Prophet وسلم, entered the house while there was a curtain with pictures on it. The color of his face changed. Then he grabbed the curtain and had it torn into pieces. <clears throat> the Prophet وسلم, said, Verily, among the most severely punished on the day of resurrection are those who make such graven images. SubhanAllah. And you can see what happened to, to the Christians, right? What happened to the Christians? Probably because of their legacy from the Romans, right? And, you know, the Romans, they were just obsessed with imagery, right? Uh, paintings, imagery, all of that. Just look at the Sistine Chapel, right? Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. And you see there's literally a painting of God and Adam and Satan and 
do you know what I mean? It's like, what's going on? You know, like there's an old man with a long beard and that's God. And you can see what happened to the Christians, right? They, and again, even amongst the Christians, they had wars because some Christians didn't agree with that. You know, they removed, uh, they, they were iconoclastic and they, rem they wanted to remove all of the imagery because they saw it as a bid'ah, right? <laughs> they saw it as a bid'ah in their, in their theology. But then others were, no, they wanted the imagery. And you can see what's happened. Saints, images of Mary, Jesus. Jesus is a white man <laughs> with blue eyes, apparently, right? Um, so basically they just created God and Jesus and all of the people who they worship or they revere in their own image, white people, right? SubhanAllah. And you must know that uh, the famous story of Malcolm X when, you know, when he confronted a Christian pastor and said, you know, why, why is Jesus, why, why is he uh, white? You know, you're getting us to worship a white man you're basically getting us to worship a white man because you believe God is white. And, you know, he, he made a point that that was used as a way to get basically Africans, right, or African people of black heritage to worship a white man, right? And then what happens is it's seared into your mind that this is the ideal, right? If you're literally worshiping a white man, who you think is God or God's son, what does that do to your psychology? You know, anyway, inshallah, I'm going to end with that one. So next time, um, we'll carry on and then we'll also go on to this, which is um, when somebody dies, wailing, you know, wailing and what are the limits to that? crying and wailing what is the point what is the difference we'll go into that because wailing and saying certain types of statements when somebody passes away out of lamentation is a major sin yeah okay so the sister said sister's asking about look with kids pillows and duvet cases okay just avoid it you know, I didn't, I didn't used to like my children to have animals on their clothes, personally. I, I just felt uncomfortable with that. Just avoid it. Why, why do you need to do that? There's so many clothes nowadays, all different types, all different types of themes. You know, if they're into a football team, you could do that, you could have that, or you could have anything, you know, any other interests. So I think our role as parents, isn't it, that we, we're always trying to steer them towards something more positive, right? If they're steered towards something negative or something that could end up being negative, you're just trying to gently show them, not shut them down, but to say, hey, look, look at this option, this is better. And I'm just gonna end with one last uh, funny story, which is when my kids were younger, so my husband supports Liverpool, right? Football team. <laughs> And so, so did I as a young person. I don't really care that much, to be honest. Um, and when my sons were younger, because I wanted to avoid them wearing a T-shirt that said Carlsberg on it, right? <laughs> or that said Standard Charter, which is like a, I think it's an investment bank or some kind of banking thing, right? When my son got into football, I bought him an Arsenal T-shirt, okay? <laughs> because the Arsenal, I think it said Ittihad, right? I, I've forgotten what it said, but it, see, that, that's how connected I am to football. But uh, whatever it said, it was something decent, right? And so I felt good that, okay, my son is wearing a football kit that has something decent written on it. But unfortunately, the legacy of that has been that in my family, <laughs> there are like four different diff football teams being supported. And my husband blames me until today for his sons not supporting Liverpool. So anyway, I just thought I'd share that.
funny story with you, though I had a good intention. I wanted to avoid my, I, I didn't like to see my flesh and blood, you know, my pure children wearing something that has, that is a logo of a, of, you know, like a, a, a beer company or a bank or something, right? And of course my husband agrees with that, but I think he wishes that um, I hadn't put my kids in, in another team's shirt. Jazakallah khairan, sisters. With that, I will leave you. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. See you next time.